the beginning, first of all, and this is not going to be like the House of Commons. This will be much more like the House of Lords. <laughs> this will be, somebody once said that the House of Lords was proof of the existence of life after death. So this will be, this will be very gentle, very well mannered, um, and at the end of it we'll have an exercise in guided democracy, we'll have a vote, and I will tell you who won. <laughs> Stalin once said, it's not the voting that matters, it's the counting. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be, we'll be in that uh, area of democracy this afternoon. Now, uh, I've got a immensely distinguished panel. Um, two deans, not just one. Uh, Harold Macmillan was once having dinner with three former prime ministers and said, what's the collective noun for a group of one of prime ministers and somebody suggested a lack of principles. <laughs> I'm not, not sure what the collective noun for deans is. Um, but we've got uh, the dean of the Blavatnik School, um, which is into its second cohort of students and doing spectacularly well, uh, our school of uh, government. We've got the dean of the business school, Peter Tufano, uh, who had a very distinguished career in America and is now doing wonders with the business school. We've got uh, the director of the new China Center, um, and we're hugely grateful to our Hong Kong benefactors for making the China Center uh, possible, and um, Rana Mitta, um, whose many works should be available outside, but probably aren't today. Um, uh, but he's a very distinguished historian, as you know. And most important of all, we've got the BBC's chief business correspondent. <laughs> um, and uh, I was watching her at an unearthly hour this morning, and some of you may have been uh, as well. But she covers every waterfront because she was also an Oxford Don, so um, Oxford and, and the BBC, which uh, is a happy symmetry. <laughs> what we're going to. Well, never was so happy. <laughs> What we're going to discuss this afternoon is the proposition that the 21st century belongs to Asia. Now, for the last five or ten years, publishers everywhere have been knocked down by a torrent of books uh, on this subject. Um, the decline of the West, uh, the rise of the rest, um, the end of the unipolar world, and the world after America, um, the hopelessness of Europe, uh, the consequences um, for the world with uh, China and India uh, joining the world economy, the astonishing rise um, of China in the last decade. Um, does it mean that once again um, Asia is going to dominate um, the global economy and to some extent the globe politically uh, as it did until, what, the early 19th century. Um, in the 17th century, uh, China, in terms of uh, GDP, uh, was almost twice the size of, of Europe. And China and India, um, in uh, the beginning of the 19th century, were about 50, 51% of global GDP. Um, and that fell like a stone till the end of uh, the last century, or near the end of the last century, it's been zooming up again ever since. So what are the consequences from it all? Um, is it rather an old-fashioned concept to think about any country or group of countries dominating a century? Um, I'll try not to answer the question myself now. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, I've written several widely remaindered books on the topic. <laughs> which are uh, available. So, uh, <laughs> thousands of signed copies waiting for, <laughs> waiting patiently for their owners. Um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, um, ask um, uh, Linda Yu to uh, move the, am I asking you? No, I'm asking, am I asking you? Oh, yes, Linda, uh, to uh, move the motion that the 21st century belongs to Asia. 
Uh, then for the opposition to the motion, uh, Peter Tufano will uh, take the floor or turn his seat and, and address you. Then Rana Mitta will speak seconding the uh, proposition. And then finally, Mary Woods. Then there'll be a chance for rebuttal in on, from both sides. And then it'll be over to you for um, questions, comments, provided I hope you keep them fairly short. If somebody is saying anything outrageous, um, uh, you can uh, intervene. There are rather complicated rules um, that you're only supposed to interview, in, intervene um, uh, uh, if anybody's making a slanderous remark. Um, but since there are probably one or two um, Queen's Council or barristers in the audience, <laughs> uh, I doubt whether that will happen. Anyway, the motion is the 21st century belongs to Asia, and Linda, you're going to uh, speak first. Good afternoon. It's a, it's a real pleasure um, to be here. And um, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, what I want to do with the five minutes that I have is to try and set out a little bit why it is that the 21st century is going to see quite a lot of middle class growth in Asia. So the first thing I want to say, of course, is um, no century belongs to any particular country. However, if you think about the 20th century and the uh, dominance of the United States, it gives you an idea of what we're trying to, to pick up, which is which region or which country will shape this century. And I think there's a couple of very promising signs in terms of, of Asian growth. And, and uh, the Chancellor's already uh, set out some of the extraordinary statistics about Asia when you take it back in time. And I suppose that's also my starting point, which is what we've seen in the last few years is Asia beginning to regain some of the income that it had in the 19th century, where the size of the population um, as a share of global population in Asia much better corresponded with the share of GDP that Asia uh, accounted for. So for instance, in 1820, um, GDP uh, in Asia, Asia accounted for about 60% of global GDP. And it's about 66% of the world's population. And we are now uh, looking at projections where Asia, which accounts for 60% of the world's population now, will, by the next 20 years or so, um, account for more than half of global GDP. So in that sense, there's the, the prosperity of the people in terms of, in the region, gaining incomes is, well, it shouldn't be too surprising. If the region is 60% of the world's population, then surely having 60% of the world's income or output um, is, shouldn't be terribly uh, uh, remarkable. But I think, let me give you a couple more statistics which I find remarkable, which is, we don't really look at growth for growth's sake. What we really want to look at is standards of living, how people are doing. And by these same projections, by 2030, it's thought that two thirds of the global middle class, of those who are living on a decent income, will be in Asia. And that's pointing to what some might say is almost an end to poverty by having these countries regain some of the ground that they had lost. And to me, that's one of the most exciting things about um, this region. Um, as I look around, I know there'll be skepticism about whether Asia could achieve this. After all, the catch-up growth process is extremely uneven. Um, so I'll give you another couple of indicators that I think might be worth bearing in mind. The very first one is only 17 countries have joined the ranks of rich countries since World War II. Some of them have done it, like Greece, through a lot of borrowing, so maybe not the best model. Um, but for other countries, it's about having innovation, technology, progress, improving productivity. That's what's lifting incomes, improving people's wages, their livelihoods. And if you look at what's happening about 30 miles north of here in Shenzhen, you might get a sense as to how quickly things are changing in China, the biggest engine of this growth. The world's most innovative company over the last few years in terms of patents filed is a company called ZTE, uh, which is based there. 
um, of the telco companies, telecoms, very technological space. Three of the top five companies globally are located in Shenzhen, and they're Chinese. The other two are Ericsson and Samsung. And that gives you an idea as to how it is this growth is being powered. Um, I'm not seeing large problems and large reasons why debt uh, growth could falter. For instance, China has debt problems that we're all very aware of. The rest of the region is very susceptible to hot money flows or outflows. So there's lots of things which can get in the way. But there are also promising signs. And quite a lot of these signs, I just want you to bear in mind. So very finally, um, as I look around, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to make a comment, which I hope you won't take offense at, which is, I think most of you remember the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> I know there were some late college dinners last night. So, <laughs> um, but unlike these students I had at Oxford who were born in 1992, um, you do remember the 1980s. So let me just give you an anecdote from Hollywood, which will clearly sway your vote. Um, in terms of how quickly things could change. Um, back to the Future, movie of the 80s. Michael J. Fox goes to the 1950s and says, I'm back to the future, I need to make my parents meet and make sure they get together so I can be born. The scientist he meets says, prove you're from the future, tell me something about the future. And he says, uh, Ronald Reagan is president of the United States. And the scientist goes, an actor is president of the most powerful country on earth. Come on, you're pulling my leg, you're not from the future, give me something else. Michael J. Fox says, uh, you see that TV you have in the future? Japan makes these really cool TVs and like the best VCRs and cool cars. You know, you'd just be amazed. Scientist looks at him and says, now I know you're not from the future because made in Japan is just low end uh, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> so in, the, in the span of 30 years, quite a lot can change. So um, I hope that You'll bear that uh, persuasive argument from a Hollywood movie in mind <laughs> when you think about um, what could possibly change in this century as we see the reemergence uh, of Asia, as people in this region become uh, join the middle class and regain some of the prosperity that it had lost during the last century. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now for the opposition. Uh, Mr. Tafano, the Dean of the Saudi Business School. So good afternoon, Mr. Chancellor, uh, Vice Chancellor and guests. Uh, our opposition has made tremendous arguments here, and they have bases for these arguments. There's a bookshelf out there with all their books. Um, <laughs> but there's a difference between celebrating the recent past and the near future and the far future, and that's what we have to think about right now. What we're really talking about is you voting to say that in the next 86 years, you can predict what's going to happen. To, be, to vote for this motion, you have to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that, that in fact Asia or China or whichever part of Asia you'd like is going to dominate in economics, in politics, in sports, in arts, in literature, in every field, because that's what the US dominance is too. Uh, oh, excuse me, I'm American. <laughs> If you have any doubts whatsoever, then I think you're going to have to vote in opposition. And so predicting the future at this so early in the game is very difficult. There's a game called baseball. Uh, we're not even quite in the second inning of a full game with nine innings of baseball. And there's statistics in baseball, and it's virtually impossible to predict, you know, two innings in, who's going to win. There's a great headline in 1948. It said, Dewey beats Truman. Um, for those of you who are Americans, but in fact, Truman beat Dewey. It was a little too early to tell. And in economics, it's in fact hard to tell as well. So if we were to roll back the clock and we were to think, well, who owned the 20th century? And we were in 1914, who would we guess? Would we have guessed the United States? And the answer is no. So if you think about the, the wealthiest countries in 1914, the top countries in 1914 were the United Kingdom, right? And two others that you're not going to guess, Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> Cheap. Cheap drove the economy. <laughs> and the US just barely made it onto the list. If you looked at industrial production, the country at the top of the list, Germany. If you looked at science, there were seven Nobel Prizes given out in 1913-1914. Only one went to the United States. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the country that everyone thought was going to be the winner was Argentina. So Argentina had experienced 43 years of consecutive growth 
and a 6% compound annual growth rate. Everyone project projected that Argentina was the winner. It was attracting immigrants from all over the world. It was one of the world's leading economies. Argentina did not win. We would have held the 1914 alumni weekend in Buenos Aires. <laughs> but we probably would not have found that at the end of the century that Argentina won. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that Asia is Argentina, but there are some factors that we need to consider. And so one of the points that Linda made is that there are a lot of people in Asia, and that's definitely the case. The sad, fact is, the sad fact is, though, they will be old people. And let's talk about, seriously, demography for a moment. One of the most important things that will determine the future of the next century is, in fact, the population of, of these regions. And China, let's stick on China for a moment, has this unfortunate tendency, not tendency, but fact, that they're experiencing a massive demographic deficit. What that means is a large number of elderly people relative to a small base of young people. There's a picture called the Population Pyramid. The world looks like this. Young people down here with lots of them and old people up here. Uh, China's currently looks like this and in 2050, which is only halfway through the, the century, they'll look like this. With the opening up of the one-child policy, what they're gonna look like is a concave, or not, well, like this, right? And that's the worst population possible because it's called a dependency ratio. You need to take care of old people and you need to take care of young people. And the folks in the middle have to drive the economy. I'm afraid that that sheer demography is going to put tremendous pressure on Asia and make it very, very difficult for it to succeed. So on that dimension, I'm afraid I can at least cast some doubts into the arguments that the other side is making. It's more than demography, it's also institutions. In order for a country to succeed, the institutions have to be strong and powerful. Now, I want to read an important quote from an important author. Um, the rule of law and other market-supporting institutions such as private property protection are weak, and there's no independent judiciary giving rise to the so-called China paradox, where the country has grown well despite not having a well-developed set of institutions. China's economic growth is therefore in many respects both impressive and puzzling. It is also, like many other fast-growing economies, not assured of sustaining such, uh, such economic growth. The author, my opposition. <laughs> For, the, for Asia to be in, to own this century is natural resources. And a report came out just this week from HSBC. And the report's title was No Water, No Food. And without, you know, all kidding aside, um, the sheer amounts, the sheer shortages of water and other natural resources will inhibit the growth. So there are a couple of biases that we study in economics. One is recency bias and the other is over-optimism bias. Over-optimism is we tend to be optimistic about the future and overconfident. I call it the Oxford Don bias. Um, <laughs> and, and recency is we tend to extrapolate the future, extrapolate the present into the future. In both cases, don't succumb to these biases. Vote against this motion. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, second in the proposition is uh, Professor Rana Mitter. Ladies and gentlemen, I think at least one result we're not going to extrapolate from the excellent last speech by Dean Tofano is that this side is going to win the debate. Since <laughs> in the wider and longer term, we're clearly going to change that tide. Now, I want to start by throwing to you a couple of headlines which might have come from recent news shows. Syria in crisis. How will Brazil respond? High-level research and technology development. Will Egypt make the grade? Now, sad though it is for those who are in Brazil or in Egypt, and luckily we're not holding the uh, alumni weekend in either uh, Cairo or indeed in Brasilia today, it is the fact that these headlines still make no sense in the world of the early 21st century. If you were to substitute China or India in either of those sentences, they would make perfect sense because they give us something better than mere statistics or even extrapolation. They give us an idea of the way that the world is going. 
Some decade or so ago, when Jim O'Neill of Goldman Sachs came up with the term BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China, BRIC to describe the emerging markets, the fact is that 10 years later, we have to say that he only got it about 50% right. In fact, the correct terminology should have been ick rather than brick. But the fact is that that wouldn't have led to so many invitations to Davos. Doesn't sound quite so snappy. If we look at the broad trend of where things are going in a whole variety of areas, we do not have to answer that we like the idea, or that we think it's a wonderful idea that the 21st century belongs to Asia and is going to move in that direction. We merely have to say that that is what the evidence says. For good or ill, clearly the weight is there. Let's take one example. China's military spending. Clearly one of the factors which is changing the geopolitics of this region and the world. 120 billion US dollars being spent in that particular area and rising by a heavy percentage year by year. Again, the population question has been put uh, both by my um, uh, proponent uh, and colleague the Deguer and also rebutted by Peter Stefano. 60% of the population of the world in Asia, and yet, of course, it is the case that even if many of them are old, many more of them are young and growing in number, all across the continent, in Pakistan, in India, in Indonesia, creating part of that 18.5 trillion US dollar GDP, which makes up a quarter of the world's GDP and growing. Compared, let us say, to Latin America, one of the reasons we wouldn't be in Buenos Aires is that with only 6% of the world's population, it's not even in the running. But I want to turn to one other area that I think actually, again, really makes the case for us. And that is the argument that in the end, it is the cultural argument that will win. And this was mentioned by Peter Tefano, who was already confessed under hideous torture to being an American. Now, <laughs> I'm afraid that if you look at the trend of where things are going, while just at this moment, it's true that the English language has a certain dominant status, 175 million people around the world have Mandarin as a second learned language, and that number is growing year by year. And one of the reasons we can tell that this trend is going in a particular direction is from one very important indicator, Oxford University, the ancient seat of learning we all know. What has it chosen to do at the beginning of the 21st century? Thanks to the benevolence of philanthropists, including Mr. Dixon Poon and many other donors, it is setting up a university China center. That is going, of course, with the Nissan Center for Japanese Studies, which they established some years ago, and a new India Center, which will be established uh, in some, uh, at some time uh, in the near future. And if you doubt Oxford's predictive power, for more than 600 years, we have been choosing global languages and working with them. Admittedly, in the 14th century, that language was medieval Latin. <laughs> Admittedly, we are still teaching medieval Latin. <laughs> Let it never be said that Oxford is anything for the short term. <laughs> that investment in China, Japan, and India, we're showing that once again we do that. Oxford, as you know, never makes mistakes. After all, they get a review in. <laughs> On the other hand, it hired me, so. <laughs> Let me finish off with one further thought about the cultural argument. I have to say that we have already had our opponents pointing out they hail from the United States and, in the case of Professor Woods, from New Zealand. Now, contrast that with what you have in the proposition with Indian and Chinese backgrounds being represented. Great food on one side, dim sum, mood makani, dung bao chicken, as opposed to hamburgers. <laughs> Bollywood, Salman Khan, uh, movies, uh, kung fu movies including Jackie Chan, South Korean soap operas, and of course the mighty cultural power, $5 billion a year of income that is Hello Kitty. <laughs> major cultural power you haven't met my six-year-old daughter. <laughs> when we ask the New Zealand argument to reply, I have one word for you, and that word is hobbits. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think in terms of where we are going rather than where we have been, I rest my case for Asia. Thank you. the dean of the Bavatnik School, <laughs> not speaking for Hubble.
I've been invited to defend sheep, cheese, and hobbits. <laughs> so, but I'm not going to. Um, I want to start by actually talking about a long train ride that I was on recently. Not a train that went from Beijing to Shanghai, nor a train that went from Delhi to Mumbai. Actually, a train ride, the time it takes to take is in inverse relationship to the length of line. It's a train ride many of you are familiar with. Oxford, Didcot Parkway, Reading, Slough, London. <laughs> so how many of you have been on that train? <laughs> okay, so we've all been on that train. You know the story. So a young couple jumped onto the train and they had two bags and they <coughs> slung them in a sort of careless way onto the ground. And a passenger then got on the train and tried to sort of run down the corridor and tripped and fell on one of these bags. The young lady of the couple immediately said, that's your bag, to her male companion. And he said, no, it's not. It's full of your stuff. <laughs> now, the point of this story is that neither was very keen to claim that the bag belonged to them. Now, why? Because by claiming the bag belonged to them, they had to take responsibility. So I want to just put to you that what the other side really need to tell you is that you want Asia, you want the 21st century to belong to Asia, and it's a cunning ruse. Because if Asia wants to claim the 21st century, what it's trying to claim is responsibility for climate change, food shortages, peak oil, resource scarcity, pandemics, the failure of global institutions, the next global financial crisis. And do you want all of that to belong to you? <laughs> I mean, maybe you do. Maybe there's some really ambitious ones among you who are thinking, Pax Britannica, Pax Americana, and now it's our turn. Is it Pax Asiana, Lord Chancellor? Is it <laughs> Pax Asiana? I'm not sure what the, the uh, you can see I didn't do enough Latin. Um, <laughs> But just before you leap to that conclusion that you want that, just think about what it means to be the hegemon in the world, to be the person in charge of that Pax. It means being the world's reserve currency, for example. Is this what China wants? Would this be what India would want? To be the reserve currency means letting your politicians loose with no budget constraint, right? able to just print money as much as they would like. It means living on that knife edge where you rely on the rest of the world's demand for your currency. And so your currency is strong, and that means you export less and less. So your demise is foretold. Do you really want a world in which you, in Asia, are forced to in entertain and develop what former American presidents called entangling relations? I mean, the United States did not want to take on that hegemonic role. You'll recall the great reticence they had about entering into the First World War. The same reticence in entering into the Second World War, this constant refrain that they must avoid these entangling relationships. Now, some of you might think that that's because Americans are by nature shy and retiring and quite <laughs> stepping back and letting others rush forward. I'm sure Peter would agree. But <laughs> actually, it's not. It's because taking on that hegemonic position, taking on those responsibilities, comes at tr tremendous cost. The other great cost for the hegemon is the cost of actually having to have institutions that the whole world will use, that will serve the whole world. And here, actually, the United States does have an advantage. Because it's a nation made up of people from all different nationalities, unlike any of the other contenders for global hegemon, it's got a system of law, of transparent law, of a rule of law that everybody can use, which actually rather fits in a globalizing world at the moment. And it's difficult for any other country at the moment to mimic or to, to shape. It certainly means that for an Asian contender for the hegemonic role, 
huge, dramatic institutional change would have to take place. And so let's move to the other side's arguments, just very briefly. The rising middle class, of course, across the world and, of course, in Asia. But that's not the world belonging to Asia. That's not taking responsibility for the bag that's left on the floor of the train at all. That's just sitting back and enjoying your cup of tea and your copy of the Times. And then the cultural argument, the fact that people around the world are beginning to learn Mandarin. How many of you learned French at school? Come on, hands up. How many of you learned French? I mean, pretty much all of you. Was there a Pax Francaise, I ask you? No. How many of you have sat in Hong Kong eating French food? I mean, lots of you. The cultural argument does not translate across to the 21st century belonging to Asia. Now, I put to you that if you're from this region, you don't want to take any part of this belonging responsibility <laughs> stuff. You want to just be sitting on that train enjoying your cup of tea. I hope we'll do so soon. <laughs> In view of that rather grim description of the 21st century, I think I'm going to, I'm going to propose an amendment to the motion. Uh, the 21st century belongs to France. <laughs> Now, I'm going to ask um, uh, Professor Ritter to, um, to admit her, I mean, sorry, I was just um, transposing. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask Rana to uh, rebut the arguments which she's just heard. I think, um, I think we have only uh, one minute for uh, rebuttal, which means that I shall have to be um, speedy. And so I'll just take up the very last point that Naren has made in which she argued that linguistic dominance and linguistic um, uh, spread really in the end was not of any relevance in the early 21st century. In which case, she won't mind if I say the following. It's also culturally extremely powerful. On the one hand, it has a traditional Confucian culture in some way, showing that Confucianism is perfectly compatible with uh, democracy. But at the same time, also is the soft power, sorry, yeah, soft power um, powerhouse of the region, everything from cartoons, movies, soap operas, K-pop, yes, I vaguely know about this, I have to say, although the six-year-old daughter helps on these things. All of the things which combine together make the combination of why Asia will continue to grow and continue to influence not just its region, but the entire world at a time when the hamburgers and hobbits fall into, uh, into, uh, into disuse and suity. So I'm going to ask you to reject those options and instead cast your votes in favor of the 21st century belonging to Asia. Thank you. Uh, Larry, would you like to uh, rebut for that nonsense? No bias, that was very, extremely good and entertaining. I looked at all of it. There are 
nimble, crafty bunch that other team. So they switched language on us. <laughs> and now it would seem they've switched argument on us. So having been devastated clearly by our arguments about China, Japan, and India, their argument rests on the dominance of South Korea. <laughs> um, now what we've argued, by contrast, is that the responsibilities of the 21st century, which are serious responsibilities, lie with every one of you in this room, regardless of what region you're from, regardless of what country you're from. The responsibilities of the 21st century belong to all of us, not just to one region. And I'll just leave you that with that thought. Okay, now it's um, over to you, up to a point. Um, but I will cut off brutally anybody who speaks for too long. Um, there are um, roving mics um, uh, available. Um, what I suggest is that you um, raise a hand in the um, usual manner, uh, say who you are and uh, where you're from, particularly if you were at Balliol. <laughs> Times as long. <laughs> <laughs> we normally do. Um, <laughs> it's been in 50 years. Um, so over there, and uh, keep it keep it fairly short. And I'm looking forward to somebody making the case for North Korea. <laughs> first, first over there. Yeah. So name and um, copy. Matthew. Matthew Goldie Scott, uh, St. Cross. Um, I, I have a question uh, to an issue that was raised by. Oh, so, sorry, hold on a little bit, Matthew. Hello. Ah, excellent. Hi, um, I, I have a question um, pertaining to a point that was raised by the by the uh, opposition, um, and I would like to see what the what the proposition's uh, stance on this is, and it, 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 it pertains to the the rule of law, um, and there there are many concerns about. Uh, the, the, the implementation of the rule of law in all areas is stemming from, from, from concerns about corruption, transparency, across to uh, you know, very valid concerns about, about IP. And, and those were the real or perceived um, impede investment and confidence in markets um, and, and in government institutions. And I, I'm very interested as to is it, the, the views of the, of the proposition relating to those, those concerns and, and the impact they may have on the validity of their, of their argument. Do you want to respond briefly? Um, I, I think the, the, uh, the answer is uh, uh, Peter kindly quoted one part of my book. But if you'd like to uh, read the other 300 pages, <laughs> 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 which, which essentially uh, sets out the case that the, um, there are a lot of developing countries, of which developing Asia, many, many countries here are underdeveloped. <coughs> institutions are rather organic. So China is, has a lot to do in terms of the institutions. However, in many ways, if you look closely at what they've done, a lot of the rule of law is improving and in fact have been substituting for other reforms on the institutions to give markets that sense of stability, that sense of molding expectations. So of course, as we say, lots of uncertainties over the growth path. But the track record of the growth is that China, despite this, has done what a lot of developing countries, which by the way, the US was in this position, um, as my book points out, <laughs> uh, back when its legal system was being developed. And in fact, China's further along than the United States at the same point of per capita income in terms of its rule of law than even the US was. And so if you look across the region, I would say just beware that there are no such thing as perfect institutions. And what you need to see is the track record, which I clearly specify in both that book and the subsequent book, which is also out there. <laughs> no. I would just footnote that by saying that in most countries, um, a rule of law and the development of a rule of law has been driven in part by foreign investors and foreign business going into a country. And the challenge for China is that it's created a parallel and separate system to deal with its foreign investors' disputes. 
And so, unlike in other countries where those disputes have led to a strengthening of the rule of law in general, in China we're seeing these two parallel universes emerge. And I think that that will slow down reform in China. Okay. So David. David Tang, I come from my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Two points against the proponents. Number one, probably 300 and rising to half a billion Chinese are going to learn English in the next 20 or 30 years. Number two, you talk about GDP. Well, anybody can win on that scale. China is going to win very soon. You've got to talk about GDP per capita because if you look at Asia, there are at the moment probably half a billion people living below two dollar per day under, and their GDP per capita is extremely low. And if you extrapolate arithmetically, when China and Asia going to catch up the United States on the premise, as I calculated once, on the back of the envelope, 2% rise in America, 5% rise, it will still take 78 years before Asia will catch up. So that's a long time. So I wouldn't concentrate on this GDP. I would much sooner if you concentrate, and therefore your argument would be much more difficult if you were to concentrate on GDP per capita. Thank you very much. Uh, over there on the left. Paul Letters, Paul Letters Keyboard College. Um, and Western soft power is, is vast. China's political system limits its soft power, in my opinion. Does the panel believe that China is, is poised to overtake American soft power? Rather? At the moment, I think. At the moment, I think it's absolutely clear that China has very limited soft power for exactly the reason that you're talking about. It has huge economic power, significantly growing geopolitical power. The military figures I mentioned are part of that. Very low soft power. Although in Asia as a whole, Japan and South Korea at least are soft power uh, um, giants uh, in, in that sense. However, all that has to happen, and it's a big if, but we China surprised us so many times before, is for China to liberalize and democratize its system. I think that that is probably the greatest argument that could be used by India, for instance, in hoping that China doesn't democratize and liberalize. Because if China can do the things it can do now, the level of GDP growth, the level of bringing people out of poverty, the level of uh, GDP per capita, I mean, today I've mentioned GDP per capita, but in China it's now something like 8,500 US dollars per person per year. In India it's still just 3,500. If it did all those things and liberalized and democratized, something which would do China no harm whatsoever and plenty of good, then its soft power would rise exponentially within just a few uh, weeks and months. So those who hope for the continued power of the West had better hope that China doesn't democratize, because if it does, that would answer your question. But why, why, um, why Rana, do so many Indians think they should vote for Mr. Modi so that India would become more like China? I believe, um, I believe the late Karl Marx, who was of course not an Oxford graduate, used to refer to this as false consciousness. The slightly longer answer is that in this particular case, India, I mean in my personal opinion, may be about to vote for a politician who I think has dangerously communal views. The beauty though of India is that it also has an excellent record over the last 70 years of voting out politicians who take too many liberties or find themselves um, at the uh, mercy of a wrathful electorate. And that's a lesson that could be learned in other large Asian countries and elsewhere around the world, I think. But I think the, the, the soft power argument, um, Rana, that you're making is a little tricky. If you think of Japan, which liberalized and democratized and had a very high level of GDP, what is it that didn't translate into great soft power when Japan was the second largest economy in the world? And I think it points us back to the fact that one of the reasons why the United States has enormous soft power is that when it goes into international uh, negotiations, it comes to it with a whole network, not just of other governments that it's coordinated with behind the scenes, 
but also of civil society organizations, of media organizations, of a communication strategy, um, and that it's bringing all of that to bear in those negotiations, and that that gives it not just its hard power from its economic and military might, but a considerable amount of soft power. But Japan has very extensive soft power, particularly in the realms of culture, Nari. I mean, manga, hairstyles, film, all of these things actually give Japan a great deal more power mm -hmm. in terms of not just the region, but actually globally as well. It, it's, it's ambiguous. Was the gentleman asking about hairstyles? <laughs> <laughs> just checking. <it. laughs> yeah. uh, my question, uh, from Africa originally, uh, I believe, via my mother. Um, I. Uh, so I think the, uh, the dean of the business school noted that uh, the preeminence of Argentina at the beginning of the 20th century. And I don't know if this is coincidentally, but there's a famous um, economist at Tsinghua University called uh, Huang Gang, um, who uh, estimates, insofar as it's possible to estimate these things, that corruption in China currently ranks at around kind of 85% of, uh, sorry, 15% of GDP. So kind of every $100 it's produced, 15 sold it away. Um, so I think the key to all of this is really depends on the kind of the development of, uh, of institutions and kind of uh, political reforms and particularly the rule of law. Um, and with that kind of sleight of hand, um, I'm just uh, wondering kind of to what extent does anybody on the panel think that in the interests of uh, promoting Asian ownership of the 20th century by offloading uh, and thereby kind of offloading kind of all responsibility from the West um, by promoting uh, Chinese democratization uh, via Hong Kong, um, whether in light of the recent debates that we've had on the meaning of uh, universal suffrage uh, in Hong Kong as defined kind of, uh, or as mentioned in the uh, Sino-British uh, Joint Declaration, uh, given that the kind of the Chinese uh, regularly uh, kind of release documents uh, relating to uh, negotiations that uh, give their interpretation of, of that word, whether it would be helpful if the British side, uh, ironically in the interests of uh, promoting the, uh, the, the rule of law and kind of legal certainty, uh, whereas I can imagine in the UK the reaction of a judge um, or the Supreme Court kind of would pretty much balk at the idea of using Hansard on a regular basis to interpret any kind of legislation passed by Westminster, whether actually in this very specific particular situation, whether it could actually kind of facilitate um, uh, local political reforms by uh, making available more of those documents relating to the kind of Sino-British joint uh, declarations. Wow. You take the first part and the rest of us can avoid the second part. <laughs> I'll take the first three minutes or so. Um, but the, the point about, Linda had mentioned that uh, you know, China isn't the same point that the US was at some point ago. Um, and actually, the gentleman's point about corruption is quite important. Um, so there's an uh, Alex Partner survey that just came out in the last couple of weeks and it surveyed corporate managers in Asia. Um, and 80% report significant corruption risk of doing business in Asia. Now, who knows how that survey was conducted, but 80% is a substantial number. Another study came out by Ernst & Young also recently um, that, that highlighted corruption, fraud, and uncertain regulation as real impediments to growth. So while it is true that institutions are growing and uh, improving with, in the region, uh, I think the gentleman's first point is, is quite relevant, that you know, certain levels of growth can only be attained when certain barriers are, are, are uh, passed. And this one seems quite significant. May I just quickly comment on this? Um, there, the, the kind of corruption is obviously a big problem in most developing countries, and China is no exception. And sometimes you look at their efforts at combating corruption and you say, well, is this real? Is there any tangibility to it? And um, if you look at the, uh, the attempts by the Chinese president to uh, cut back on official corruption, so. Um, a sign of his uh, seriousness, I guess, is that Chinese banquets can only now have one soup and three dishes. And any of you who know about Chinese ban banquets know this is, <laughs> this is a sign. But I mean, more seriously, I think one of the um, 
things not to be uh, forgotten is the US, again, at the turn of the last century, the robber barons, the, the degree of institutions, um, the, there is no system which is perfect. Any system which is transplanted uh, never works. Legal systems are transplanted across the former Soviet Union. They did not work. I just wouldn't prejudge how this turns out in this region. If you look across democratization in the region, it's a very messy process. South Korea, Taiwan, fights in the legislature. Um, I'm sure that never happens in the House of Lords, the throwing of chairs. The, I, mean, I just would not be, uh, I just, I, I'm clearly talking about uh, not the, the House. And so I think and when we think about these things, I, I come back to one thing, I used to be a lawyer. Um, it's not really what I'm. It is. It is the track record, and not what's on paper. And I think we just need to watch the track record and see what companies are worried about, and yet they still continue to plow money into this region. And in terms of the middle class, just very quickly, by 2050, OECD and others estimate there'll be 4.9 billion people in the middle class, of whom two thirds will be in Asia and that surpasses their population share. So there is a steady increase in improvements of standards of living, and the incremental improvements in institutions seems on the track record to be headed that way. Just serious on the second part of the comments. Uh, is, is, is Professor Endicott in the audience? No. That's you, you, you might find him. You, you, might, you, you might volunteer to give a copy of your lecture the other day um, on the interpretation of the basic law um, to uh, uh, the gentleman who asked the question here. Because it was an extremely serious contribution to the debate. If you want to summarize it now in 35 or 40 minutes, <laughs> we'll be hugely grateful. Oh, I'll gladly take an hour. Uh, <laughs> Um, could, could I, I had a question, what about the 22nd century? Yeah. <laughs> uh, if we get there. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so many hands going up and we've, um, we've got to, a maths lesson to come, so. Yeah, I'm um, Silas Shu from Baylor College. I thought, uh, <laughs> which I meant. <laughs> as long as you're right. <laughs> So the esteemed speaker seems to be um, arguing the question on what we perceive as, uh, I guess, orthodox metrics of success, what we perceive as liberty, conceptions of equality, rule of law, et cetera, et cetera. And I just wonder whether this, um, I guess, struggle for preeminence in the 21st uh, century um, is also about redefining those metrics of success. So to what extent is the rise of Asia about redefining those metrics and talking about those conceptions in a different way to what we have talked about? By being able to breathe reasonable air. Yeah. Yes, over there. How many of the best universities in the world are currently in Asia Pacific? And how many will be at the end of the 21st century and why? And is this relevant? <laughs> Um, I, think, I think that's a that's a wonderful comment. I I um, I saw the former president of Columbia University at Davos this year tell the following story. He said he explained that he'd gone to Beijing in part to support some of his university's fundraising efforts, and he'd been invited to a dinner with some extremely prominent Chinese business people who wanted to talk to him about how whether their children might get places at Columbia University. Um, and he explained, he immediately said that, you know, why send your children to Columbia? You know, Beida and Tsinghua, these are fantastic universities. These are world-class universities that China now has. And the assorted business people said, yes, but our children wouldn't stand a chance of getting into them. That's why we want them to go to Columbia. <laughs> a reflection on your comment. <laughs> Can I say something kind of relevant about metrics, Chancellor? <laughs> yes, I just want to add, add a note, a footnote, to Nairi's point, which um, is about American universities. There's a very good book by some writers, or a writer on the Wall Street Journal, uh, about what Americans call legacy preference. 
and they're getting into American universities. And um, there's a report of a, um, of a session when a group of young men in Manhattan are being coached for um, getting into uh, Ivy League universities. And one is being uh, prepared for his entry to Duke. And the coach says to him, now, the first question you'll get is, what would you bring to Duke if you came here? And the boy says, a library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on that um, Just to say that happiness is the metric that economists are now using um, to have a different measure of, say, success. But let me, let me just say it's actually quite universal across different regions. Um, so, for instance, you're happiest when you're young. Your happiness steadily declines <laughs> until you hit the trough between the age of 35 and 40. And then it starts to improve again, and you're delirious by the time you're in your 70s. <laughs> and that's the same across countries. But perhaps that is perhaps something we should, we should look at. And then finally, uh, married people are much more happy than divorced people, unless you're a woman. Sack of normal play golf. I, I, I <laughs> yeah, over that. Uh, Richard Hatz, uh, Worcester College failed to get into Bailey, I'm afraid. Uh, we heard about the preeminence of the UK in 1914. If the uh, proponents are right, and we scroll forward to uh, 2114, how would the, each of the speakers advise Oxford University to make sure that it's one of the top two universities in the world in 2114? I wouldn't worry, incidentally, about the last point. What if happened to Bill Clinton and Tony Blair? So. Don't worry too much about it. Um, <laughs> Oxford, two minutes. No, not two minutes. Not two minutes, probably, probably about 30 seconds. Well, the first thing you can do is uh, to give generously to support the new University China Centre, which will be, of course, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's not over that century and uh, developing. Although I don't intend to stay director as the entire century. Perhaps 75 years will, will, will do. <laughs> Broadly speaking, actually, though, I think the answer comes really by combining, this is terrible, I'm going to go out of world, but combining the points that both sides have made. Oxford stands as one of a very small number of institutions which is genuinely global and is able to engage with different cultures, different societies, different ways of doing things. The fact that it happens to be located in the United Kingdom, I think, is part of its glory in that it draws on that tradition. But the fact that it's also always, from medieval times, been an institution that looks outwards is a really important part of its identity too. So as we go through a century, in which I think we all agree Asia will become more important, whether you agree it's going to lead the 21st century or not, and how you vote, though you of course will vote for us, is another, is another question. If Oxford fails to take account of that change in terms of the weight of global presence, it will lose out. But as I think I've indicated, and I think this is a very serious point, the fact that at this stage in the early 21st century, so much investment, so much care is being taken to try and spot how those changes in, 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 uh, in, in emphasis need to be put into our curriculum, that we're laying down, I think, a really good pathway for the century that's to, to come. And our connections with Asia are an absolute central part of that. <coughs> So in all seriousness, I will second what Rana has said. Um, I think it's important that Oxford make sure that there is, everyone is always a minority when they come to Oxford, which is to say that no group is dominant. I think the second thing is to realize that we make investments that are 30, 50, 70 years in advance. So for example, in my school, um, if you look worldwide, 3% of the people who take the GMAT exam come from Africa. But if you were to guess 30, 40 years from now, which is you know, in some sense the shelf life of an MBA, you know, will 3% 3 3 of the world's activity come out of Africa, probably it's going to be far more than that. So we have to get ahead of these phenomena. And while we make sure that everyone's a minority at Oxford and that we're a diverse place, I think we have to make some bets about the future. Um, bets around Asia, bets around other geographies. And I guess I would say that, you know, Oxford is one of only, I think it's three or 400 institutions that existed 800 years ago that still exists today. So it's got a good shot, but 
if that is a statement of complacency, Oxford will die quickly. So what is it that will keep us in really in great shape until the 22nd century? And a big part of that answer is actually sitting in this room because it's, it's our alumni that are doing great, bold things in the rest of the world that can keep challenging, challenging us about what we're doing. And you know, when, we, when we started building the Blavatnik School of Government, it's alumni across the world that came and said, why on earth are you doing it that way? Why don't you do? And that engagement has really shaped and helped us to create a 21st century school. And likewise, across every other department in Oxford. So I think for Oxford, it's the challenge and the responsibility to stay open and being challenged by its alumni who are all over the world and in all sectors. And if you ever find us not being open to that, then just come at us harder. <coughs> Last two questions. Let's have, um, yep. And then. Thank you, Hany Liu from St. Hughes College. I have one professor on each side, so I have to sit in the middle, and I have to ask two questions for you, one for each. So first of all, the question about responsibilities, Professor Woods. Um, is it possible, or is it meant to be, that the definition of responsibilities, or world system, or, or the rules of the world, will be changed in the next decades or so, with the rise of China, India and other Asian countries. And then we have to talk about responsibilities in a different way. And for uh, Linda and the Professor Mita, um, of course, things have been very promising during the past few decades for China and other Asian countries. But what would be the Achilles heel in terms of development and policies in these countries, such as corruption and lack of media freedom, etc., etc., that might make the soft power or cultural impact, if there's any, quite irrelevant, irrelevant in the next few years. Thank you. Yeah, so I think the rules will change. I mean, one challenge is that with great power comes a great sense of entitlement. And for, for any great power in any domain that gets challenged by the newcomers, that sense that they're losing a little bit of their entitlement is always very challenging. So it takes rules much longer than it should to change. And if you think about global rules, that's what we're watching as the United States is challenged by a number of different um, emerging regions. So um, I think there will be change. It'll just be slower than the underlying power shifts that are driving it. We've actually got longer than I thought. Is what? My, uh, well, 20 seconds has turned into 8 minutes 32. <laughs> so, so it's a Swiss, well, obviously a Swiss watch. <laughs> so speak as long as you like. Oh, thanks. Uh, there's several more questions. Um, I'm Eleanor Bradley, uh, Telly Hall 2005. I just wondered Yay. if I could... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just wondered if I could lift the corner of the d debate slightly and change the parameters a little bit. Um, obviously, in the context where we are, we're in, we're in Hong Kong, we're talking about uh, a, a British and global institution, but we, we, it seems that d the debate has been perhaps limited by uh, a notion of nation rather than globalization. Um, and I wondered if the panel could suggest uh, another way in which um, we could div divide the globe rather than East and Western uh, groups of nations, but on, a, on another kind of scale such as uh, linguistic groups, cultural groups, religious groups. And uh, it, if you were able to do that, um, what would be your next world power? Could I briefly answer that? Because there's just one very quick statistic, which um, I think actually says something, and again, I'm afraid I'm going to hideously undermine my own side here again, so Linda will have to you know, convince me. But I was really surprised just a couple of years ago to learn that the air route between New Delhi and Beijing, you know, the two rising superpowers of the region, has only four flights a week. You, know, you, you can't even fly every day. And I think this does say something quite profound about how the connections between Asia 
which are growing and developing for sure, still have a very, very long way to go. If you look at a map of air routes around the world, the North Atlantic still has many, many more lines across that patch of water than actually is the case even in the, uh, in the Pacific. So I think when we talk about Asia as a region, we should be aware that in some ways it was much more connected 300 years ago than it is at this particular moment. I'd like to offer one brief thought about um, a way in which perhaps we should think about how the global and universal ideas can come together with something quite regionally specific. And I'll bring back something I just said very, very quickly um, at the end of my uh, rebuttal, which is about Confucianism. I'm often rather taken aback and you know, rather unhappy about the way in which in China today, Confucianism is taken as a sort of cultural tradition which is supposed to embody hierarchy and authoritarianism and modes of doing things which are essentially about kind of keeping your voice down and obeying orders. I think it's very clear that anyone who actually looks at the detail of what Confucianism is about, that it has two qualities. One is that it's about obligation and ethics, and as I've said, is in no way incompatible with democracy, as Taiwan and South Korea, amongst other countries, have shown. And secondly, that it aims to be universal. It is not necessary that Confucianism is for everyone in all things, just as many other thought systems uh, are not that way. But it has far more capacity to spread and to bind people together in a region and beyond if it is used in that kind of universalistic and liberal way than as a means of limiting people. So that might just be one pathway into what you're getting at. Can I just save our side a little bit on the Asia point? <laughs> um, there was a recent survey of the 10 best airports in the world. Um, half of them were in Asia. None of them were in the United States. But <laughs> Heathrow. Heathrow, I'm afraid, was number 10. I cannot work that one out. But on the, on the more serious point about identity, um, I'm of Chinese ethnicity, but I'm an American British dual national. And as you look on the stage here, we're a mixture of British, Indian, British, American, New Zealand. Um, I think. Um, it's a great debate to have, but I think the, what we're beginning to see is one of the things that makes Oxford so global is that we do actually think across uh, these lines. And the debate here really is just to say we see this trend in Asia. We're here in Asia having this very first <coughs> alumni reunion because we see where the potential is. And it's not to say there aren't problems, but it's not necessarily as black and white as a debate would suggest. But you really must vote for us. Why don't we have 100 bucks? Or in this phone number. Just a couple more. Yeah. Microphone. All right, while you're waiting, over there. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sue A. Thompson from uh, Christchurch. So, um, Professor Mitter, you have mentioned a number of times your six-year-old daughter, and I think that's a subliminal attempt to get the votes of the women in this room. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is actually about gender um, and the extent to which the empowerment and the engagement of women um, in different parts of the world um, has a bearing on the topic of this debate. Mm -hmm. Shall I? You better not speak first. However, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to. Uh, All right, go on. Well, if the question was directed at me, I think I should, I should take it out. I mean, I think, I think you put your finger actually on, um, again, one of the very key areas in which Asia is clearly going to have to measure up, but a whole variety of other areas will also have to do so. And since I seem to spend the entire question session undermining uh, the case for our side, I will say that actually South Korea, a country which I pointed out, has in many ways ticked many of the boxes in terms of sustainable and liberalizing development, has still a long way to go in terms of gender within that particular country. In some ironic ways, in terms of participation of women in the workforce and presence in politics, although of course President Park, the first woman president of, uh, of South Korea, is uh, a welcome uh, move in the, uh, the other direction. China, despite not having uh, a liberal polity, has actually done somewhat better in terms of inserting women into the workforce and allowing women at the lower levels, but frankly not the higher levels, to have 
greater political participation. Japan, again, I think has a very long way to go on this, although there has been one, but only one female uh, political leader in the last um, half century or so uh, of a party in, uh, in demographic, uh, democratic Japan. India's democracy, I think, is also undermined very, very strongly by the fact that the position of women continues to be very heavily entrained by gender, uh, gender stereotypes. The only thing I think that one can say is that in all these places, as the things we've talked about, as economic growth continues, as education levels continue, there is a clear sign that traditional gender roles are beginning to change. And I think that that is a trend that will continue and will ultimately make the case for um, our side here in Asia. But I will freely admit that there is a great deal of work to be done. Would you like to say a word, Rana, about gender demographics in China? One of the things, and that I think what we're getting at, Chancellor, is also a question for India, too. One of the things that is very evident is that the preference for boy children over girl children in many countries, but certainly in India and certainly in China, and through the use of, uh, of ultrasound and abortion, has created a gender imbalance of a very serious nature in both countries. Different tactics are being used by the, by the governments of both countries to try and address this. In China, there is actually quite a strongly advocated, quote marks, care for girls policy that um, is uh, trying to reverse this trend. But I would say actually that in the end, although these policies are worthwhile and worth praising, there is sometimes a slightly sort of de patronizing nature that men in charge need to work out how to get more, uh, how to uh, address this problem. I think more women ultimately being in leadership positions in these countries will do something to change that trend. Can I, can I just say that there's a very um, hard efficiency reason for why um, you want to see more women in positions of power in these countries. If you look at work on corporate boards, you very quickly see very hard evidence that having more diversity on boards, having in particular more women on boards, leads to demonstrably better corporate performance. Frankly, if you want, if you if if you want your corporate, your firm, or you want your country to compete on the world stage, you're going to have to start making equal access for women right to the very top, because otherwise you'll simply be outcompeted by those that do. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael Geltienda, Exeter, PP. Um, question to the panel, to Professor Woods, and also to the moderator. Do the recent events in Crimea suggest that the 21st century will be nobodies, that there is a risk that there be a nationalism in major powers that will result in anarchy? I think it's a... Uh, it's a very good question. I think, um, I think there is a very real scenario that we're watching of a world that is splitting into mercantilist spheres of influence. And we can see that in the Pacific, where we see the United States pushing for its trans-Pacific investment and, and, and trade treaty. And we see China trying to compete with a set of arrangements of its own. And I think that that scenario sits alongside a scenario in which we continue to have global institutions and international cooperation, but we have to move very, very quickly to update those institutions and update the way countries can cooperate. Um, but at the moment, we're seeing quite a strong move towards these, what I would call, spheres of mercantilist influence. In other, in other words, the United States, China, in the Pacific, each pushing for its own economic spheres of influence to the exclusion of the other. Very brief response. To yeah, Rana. Well, um, I think that the Crimea crisis has provided one of the most telling challenges for China's role as a new global power broker. And this gets exactly to the issues that Mao has brought out about the need for new players to work out what they're going to do in terms of global governance and institution. The annexation of Crimea. Cannot, is, is being, um, the, the, China is not addressing the annexation of Korea because on the one hand, it doesn't want to be rude about its ally Russia. On the other hand, 
it feels that the annexation of the territory of a part of another country sets a terrible precedent for China because obviously separatism there is one of the absolute bugbears, no-nos of China. The problem is that if China really does what it says it wants to do, which is to play a full, responsible, and active role in international society, it does need to choose. It does need to make an open statement about what it thinks about this action. And I spoke to a Chinese diplomat just four days ago, obviously off the record, in which she admitted that it was very difficult for him to say anything precisely for this reason. But I think the time has stopped when China was able simply to abstain and sit at the back of the room. And if it really is going to be part of that Asian 21st century, which of course it is, then, <laughs> then, then the time has come, I think, for it to sit wholeheartedly in those international structures rather than this rather half-hearted way that it's done up to now. This is the moment at which I'm supposed to summarize uh, the uh, discussion, um, hobbits included. Um, but I'm not going to. I'm going to just respond very briefly to that last question and to what um, my colleague from Balliol said uh, uh, earlier. Um, I think this has been a fascinating debate uh, and great fun. Um, and there'll be lots more books written. <laughs> and uh, many that have already been written, read, in even uh, greater detail. But I think it's a frightfully old-fashioned question. Um, I suspect that the 21st century isn't going to belong to a country or a group of countries. Uh, I think it's going to belong to ideas and uh, the communities which can best combine uh, the ideas which are likely to produce sustainable growth, um, sustainable development, um, harmony, uh, inclusive development, uh, and one hopes um, uh, international cooperation. And I think what is um, uh, a lethal um, uh, uh, foe of all that is the politics of identity. <coughs> There's a wonderful book by um, an Arab, a Lebanese, a Christian Lebanese who writes in French and lives in Paris, called Armin Malouf. Um, and with that complicated background, a bit as you were all describing, he finds it quite difficult to see himself in simple terms as belonging to one ethnicity, one nation, one group. And he says at the end of this wonderful demolition of the politics of identity, which is called out the question of identity, he says that when you're a writer, um, you hope that somebody will take down your book from the shelf in 100 or 200 years' time and be impressed by what you've written. And he says that his hope is rather different. He hopes that his grandson will take this little book off the shelf in a few years' time, and it'll be there among all the novels he's written that have won the Prix Goncourt and other prizes. We'll take down this little book on the question of identity and say to himself, my God, did people have to write books about that in those days? <laughs> <laughs> and that's rather my hope about the 21st century, but that might have been too sanctimonious a note on which to finish, um, even for a chancellor. And um, I now have to preside over the uh, democratic process um, and decide, according to whim at the end, uh, <laughs> who has won. And I suppose we could, we could try it without counting um, by putting the proposition and inviting you to shout your approval or otherwise. <laughs> it might, might be easier to fudge the result if we do that. Um, let's, let's try that to begin with. So I will put the proposition, wait for it. Um, I'll put the proposition. This is much more democratic than Strictly Come Dancing. Um, <laughs> the 21st century belongs to Asia. Um, if you believe that to be true, um, when I give the word, you shout, I. The 21st century belongs to Asia. Aye. Aye. The nose? So nobody... <laughs> Next. 
let's try that again. This is extraordinary. This is a, this is a Crimea result. Uh, All those who disagree with the proposition that the 21st century belongs to Asia shout no. no. I think we'll have, a, we'll have a show of hands. And Mary insists, we'll have a show of hands. And all those who think the 21st century belongs to Asia raise one hand, not more than one. Suspense is killing. <laughs> and uh, those who don't believe that the 21st century belongs to Asia. <laughs> Double voting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the vice chancellor. I'm just <laughs> I just spotted that. Yes. <laughs> Very tactful. <laughs> Don't forget, this is the single transferable vote <laughs> in which the vice chancellor gets two votes. <laughs> Which is mm -hmm. And we're using the don't model. <laughs> well, it's sort of <laughs> one thing and another, really. <laughs> There's a very small majority for one side. <laughs> in a hundred years, we can find the results. But, um, but, but I'm going to invalidate the result because the vice chancellor did vote twice. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank our panel for um, their stimulating yeah. contributions, um, which were um, witty um, and uh, uh, lucid. What other extravagance can I do? <laughs> no, very, very good contributions from them all. We're all very grateful, and thank you for asking such excellent questions. Um, and good luck to all of you who are uh, intending to write books on this subject. <laughs> um, I think we come back, what, in, in how long? How long? We come back in 20 minutes for maths. Um, but I <laughs> promise you, that if you haven't heard him before, um, you will greatly enjoy um, Professor de Sotoy, and you will think when you've heard him that you understand everything there is to know about maths. And then you leave, and your partner asks you what he said, and you have to try to remember. <laughs>